bunch of you have already probably heard about part of this talk, so we'll go from there. Uh, I'm Adam Brin. I'm one of the developers of the data arc tool. Chris is mostly uh, focused on the front end, and I'm on the back end. Data arc is a large multidisciplinary. What? Can you speak? He's at the back. Yeah, can you speak up? Uh, is the microphone actually tied to me, or is it, or is it this giant one here? Okay, I'll st I'll stay closer to the mic. Is that better? Okay. So Data Arc is a large multidisciplinary uh, organization focused on the interactions between people and uh, the environment and archaeology across the North Atlantic. It is a mixture of many different groups and many different organizations. Um, it, the data in it and the types of people involved are generally specialists. Specialists in the environmental data, specialists in the sagas, specialists in the historical data. And they're, they focus a lot on their own information. But it's really important for all of the parties involved to get more information about all of the other types of data. And so one of the challenges of developing a, a tool that allows for this broad interdisciplinary research and interaction is how do you bring all of the other disciplines into the same data? How do you get those conversations, those interactions, and those conceptual issues involved? So you can see we've got the, the C database, you've got Geesley's uh, storied lines, his historical database, you have uh, the saga maps, you have all of this different information being put into this tool. One of the challenges of this, however, is the complete difference in the data. Um, you have observational data uh, recorded from pollen cores or other information you have counts of bones and archaeological typical faunal information. You have descriptive information. And so how do you actually get these pieces to mesh together? How do you get it to link? Um, you can put it up on a map. You can put it on a timeline. But beyond that, even keyword search, other basic techniques that we'd use um, in either library sciences or other information techniques just sort of fall apart. There's, there's nothing to sort of bond or link together. And so one of the things that we've sort of focused on is grouping the information into types and then focusing on how we could actually link it together. So having a concept of the textual information, the archaeological information, and the environmental information. And this is useful in two different ways, one of which is it allows you to explore the data and without focusing on, oh, this is mine, but instead to get a broader sense. But also, it gives us a way of sort of talking about similar techniques for display or organization or management. Um, and then below that, we can see the, the three ways that we do try and interact and tie the data together, the spatial relationships, the temporal relationships, and the conceptual ones. The conceptual ones are what, in many ways, make data arc unique. We have taken a large concept map that uh, one of our colleagues built using the CIDOC CRM as sort of the, the linkages between it, and then taken the data and allowed the respective specialists of the data to construct some queries that say, uh, find me all of the, the indicators of woodland uh, in, the, in the environmental data and we will map that to woods, or find me the, the combination of a housing structure and uh, sheep bone, that we might be able to com combine that to be a concept of a farm. These queries and these map of the queries to the concepts allow for a way to link the entirely um, numeric data with the entirely textual data by mapping the concepts to a thing and then enabling those linkages to make a query. So as a sort of background of how we built the tool together, I'll pass it on to Chris to sort of talk about some of the interface questions. 
So following that, um, we have multiple different data types from multiple different data sources. And while there are multiple challenges involved in pulling all of these data providers together, you can imagine that there's quite a few challenges in pre presenting all of this in a simple user interface and presenting this in a way that's you know, intuitive in any sort of way. And so what we've tried to do is create a tool that is trying to balance that simplicity and complexity all at the same time um, and allow you to take multiple pathways to engage with all of these different data types and data sources. <clears throat> so hopefully, um, what we're trying to accomplish is uh, address a series of those challenges. So we have uh, four main challenges that just kept coming up. Um, one is that we have a number of data providers that have um, high amounts of data or large amounts of data. And then we have some that have very, you know, few amounts relative to that. And so we have to find ways of balancing the two. And so we'll talk about some of those ways that we've tried to approach that. <clears throat> And so we also have to emphasize some of these data types over a specific source. And we're tr trying to address those challenges where we have so many different data sources. How do we present this in a usable way without saying or favoring one data source or the other just because we've filtered a certain way? OK, well, if we're going to filter in a spatial way, are we only going to return only those data types that have a certain kinds of spatial data? things like that. So we're trying to accomplish these different things. And we're also trying to balance this in a way with these three, um, three components that we've realized we've kind of had to come up with in order to engage with all these different data types. So we've come up with a temporal component with the timeline, a spatial component with the map, and a conceptual component, which we'll see with the concept map. <laughs> and of course, at the very end, we're also presenting data. And we're presenting it almost in, uh, we're trying not to present it in an absolute way. We're not trying to interpret something or overinterpret something or over imply anything uh, or overfit anything in the end. Um, and so we're trying to present this in a way that's more of a guide. It's a data discovery tool, it's not an analytical tool, it's not an answer necessarily. It's just meant to give you a door to these data providers and give you a door to maybe different domains you haven't been able to. Uh, maybe really haven't explored in the past. <clears throat> so there are um, a number of different alternative in, uh, interfaces that are out there. I can review a couple of them. But all of these are trying to balance this sort of complexity. Um, so we have to decide, are we going to emphasize the user interface side and say we're only going to make something that's just simple and usable, but then do we sacrifice all of these possible ways that we can engage with the data and so we're constantly in this tug of war between, you know, do we make it just easy to use or do we throw in a mountain of tools and say, well, they'll figure it out. And so we're trying to balance this. And this is a work in progress, so hopefully we can get some feedback here. <clears throat> so um, I think a, a number of people are familiar with the Ariadne project. Um, and very quickly, uh, for those of you that are not familiar, there are very two simple ways that you can filter the data that comes through. Um, you can engage with the data with uh, a spatial filter and a temporal filter, and it actually dynamically can update the research results in a very uh, seamless sort of way. Um, there's a convenience involved with the Ariadne data, is that there is a common data model that's kind of factored in. They kind of mold some of that data into a common data model. There's, um, and that's not something that we're technically trying to do here. <clears throat> Another is uh, the FASTI model. Um, so they have a common metadata structure that is, spans across all of their uh, data records that are returned. And of course, they have similar uh, filtering strategies. Um, and the uh, one thing that we've noticed about it is that you, are, you have to be cognizant ahead of time of how your results are going to come out. And so you choose a very specific pathway. I'm going to filter on this, and then on this, and then on this. And, oh, that didn't work, and you back up. And then you filter on this, this, and you kind of step through. And it's a little uh, difficult at times to know exactly what you're going to get in the end, and then you work backwards. And so those are some challenges that we've seen others go through as well. 
So we have our interface that we've come up, our beta that we've versioned, and we'll show some of the progression through those. Um, so we've come up with uh, a number of different components. Um, at first we had a keyword component, but it sounds like uh, <laughs> latest chats were probably going to be ditching the keyword component as it does not really fit within all of the data sources, but was more of a, a comfort area for those of us that live in the UI world. Um, we love to throw search boxes on the things. Um, but for the three main components that we love to talk about are the, uh, the temporal component and the spatial component and the concept map there at the top. Uh, let's see. How is this? Yeah, concept map up here. And we've been able to structure this in a particular way where we format most of the data results into a number of different bins. And, and we've also formatted the results in particular ways, which I'll discuss briefly um, here shortly, um, into match results related and contextual. And then we can also explore the number of filters. So a brief overview of what is to come. Um, here. So going back to the challenges. So how do we deal with the problems of large versus small data sets? Well, going through some of these problems, one thing that we've realized is that um, we didn't want to cluster data. We knew we wanted to cluster data. We didn't know how best to do that. So we came up with this sort of color scheme and based on different data types, and we decided, well, we could do the quantitative approach and make proportional symbols and proportional intensities and all these different things, and we ditched that. And we said, well, we'll just go ahead and make this sort of a kind of distributed clustering sort of pattern, but we're not trying to emphasize one or the other. We think that things will get drowned out at that point, and we're not trying to do that. We're also not trying to offend any data providers who would just be missed out. And we want to be able to uh, reach out to other data providers potentially in the future. <clears throat> And also, at the same time, um, you know, there's really, we're trying to discourage the fact that at these sources at the bottom, for those of you who can't see, these are actually data sources here at the bottom. Um, you can't actually filter by a source. You can't go in and say, I want this particular default source or this default domain. I want this kind of data or this data type. We're trying to discourage that. We want you to discover these things. We want you to reach out and go into these different avenues. And so. These are some of the things that we've tried to work with in this particular challenge and this particular goal. <clears throat> so again, here again, the same problem, um, or the same challenge. So we're trying to you know, deal with the issues of emphasizing a particular data type over a specific source. So we came up with these particular three data bins, as we kind of lovingly refer to them. Um, so we have archaeological sources, textual sources, environmental sources. These are the three bins that kind of emerged from the data sources that we've been uh, provided. And so again, we've just kind of colored these by data type and kind of paid attention to accessibility patterns and, and colorblind pattern, you know, those kinds of things. And then we grouped these in a very convenient way. It was, it was very convenient that we had three, <laughs> but we've been able to group these together as well. And then of course the sources are then listed at the bottom where you can actually then at the very end see your distribution. So here's sort of our progression through our models from our prototypes to what we have at the moment. Um, so we went at the very beginning with our spatial component. We had a web GIS, very straightforward, through the points in there, one and done, and see how it worked. Well, it didn't work very well because at first, we, you know, we had 100 point, hundreds of points, and that was okay. It was functioning all right. And then we suddenly had thousands of points. And if you've ever worked with vector data in the browser of a thousand of points, it's no go. That doesn't really work out. And so um, we realized we're going to have to cluster these things together. We need to reduce the amount of vectors that be drawn on the canvas. And so we started clustering things together. And then we started deciding on how we're going to group some of these data types together. And that was rather convenient. And since we're not really doing proportional symbols, nothing's going to overwhelm anything. And so now we have these nice clusters and very few vectors are being drawn and so there's no limitation on the browser. <clears throat> and now whenever you hover any one of these, you can actually see the distributions come up based off your data type that you're looking for. Um, here's our uh, timeline or temporal component. Um, this is a typical timeline that you might see you know, on most web pages that you, you know, if you're engaging with any sort of timeline. Um, there are a number of these floating around out there. Um, this is a challenge. It's still a challenge for us. Feel free to give us feedback on this. Um, but 
Uh, one way that we came across or came up with was to whether or not we should emphasize period descriptive names or events and make it a little more convenient to the user. And the problem with that is that occasionally it would emphasize the actual period or events at the expense of the data. And so certain data points would be lost depending on scale or the resolution of the temporal data. <clears throat> so we came up with a different interface, what we've been calling these sort of temporal buckets. And so if you have, uh, and we've divided this up into three different resolutions. So we have uh, millennium and then uh, centuries, and then we have uh, decadal resolutions here. And so if you click on one of these, it would then filter and show you these distributions of each data type in terms of intensity. Here we're not highlighting data sources or anything like that. We're just showing you and kind of guiding you through like you might have some luck here. There might be a, a huge number of sources here, but we're not saying that we're not, we're not trying to drown out anything else. We're just trying to show you that you know, these things are available there. <clears throat> So another challenge or goal uh, is, oh, actually, let me skip one. Uh, so the, uh, the final component that we worked on, uh, the conceptual map, or the concept map. So the conceptual component initially just showed all uh, nodes and edges quite cleanly and very, you know, just simply displayed them, and which was nice, and just a simple force graph and done. Um, but now our current interface is a little more interactive and much more dynamic and connected to one another. You change one and one other component actually changes one and the other. And so whenever you highlight or hover or click on any node or edge now, you can actually see to a certain amount of degrees and how these man out. And then you can also uh, change the uh, actual, by clicking on this little small icon here, you can actually change the, uh, the layout of the graph itself to a concentric ring layout where you can actually see the nodes of degrees of how these sort of relate to one another and actually filter based on these concepts. So we kind of balance all of this and pull all this together into our filter management system. So all of these filters are applied at once on the same page, no shifting back and forth or anything like that. This is an SPA from top to bottom, single page application. And so everything is on the fly and asynchronous. It's really kind of nice how we were able to get this to work. And um, so with this filter manager, you see exactly how your filters are applied, exactly what happened, and you can remove them and add them as needed. And the, also the nice thing to be able to structure it in this way is that we're almost ready to implement uh, a share search or a safe search option where really you can actually create sort of maybe a hashed URL of some sort where you can cite your actual results or you can save and come back later to your results and know and see your exact filters that you've had before and that will still be there and it'll show up the exact same way. And if there are more data sources that came in, you may have actually additional results at that point, depending on if we've added more or something like that or if those data providers have added more data. <clears throat> so some of our results um, have changed a little bit. Uh, initially, we just went with a basic, you know, sort of uh, tabulated format um, based off the data source provider. Um, here, we decided to break it down a little bit more um, because we're trying not to say we have a discrete result. We're not trying to say this is exactly the way it should be. And so we have three sort of categories we've broken up. We have a match result that is pretty much what you've set. And then we've decided to come up with uh, related results, which um, usually go out to a certain amount of it, to at least one degree out in some way, depending on the filter applied. Uh, an easy example, of course, would be like the conceptual filter. If you have a single node in the center, the one node you have in the center is your match result. And so if you step out one degree out from that center, then you have um, your related results. And the next node out from that would act, or the next ring out from that, the next degree would be your contextual results. And so we're not trying to limit you or imply that these are exactly how they should be. We're trying not to leave anything out that might be, you know, or obscure any data in any way. <clears throat> so again, we don't want to imply any sort of over-interpretation or overfit the data in any way and speculate about anything. And so we are trying to solve this problem. We have so many points, for instance, that are stacked on top of one another. So 
Um, we kind of modified a, a tool in Leaflet called Spiderify, and it's really kind of nice. So you click on a particular point, and it, it pops out a number of different points, and they're all actually located in that one location. But you can now engage with all of these points, and it's quite swift in how it handles all of this. <clears throat> And this all links back to the original data. Here again, we're just a data discovery tool. And so what we want to do is keep maintaining the original integrity. We're not molding their data into our system. We're still maintaining their original system, their structures, and pointing you back there in the end. And you can still, whenever you want to figure out or ask questions about accuracy or any interpretation, you then go where you need to go for those data providers when you figure out about that source. So just some questions, discussion points that we've kind of come up with. We have a number of them, but um, uh, in addition to this, but um, so yeah. Uh, so how do we address some of the data grouping and display issues? Um, we've been able to speed up some of these things, but the conceptual maps probably, you know, still bogging down certain things, but, uh, but really just kind of how do we display the complexities of some of these data types? Uh, especially, you know, how do we display some of the the differences in the spatial nuances in some of these uh, data sources. Sometimes, you know, the, the simple schema point line polygon doesn't quite fit, and yet the data is kind of spatially enabled in, like, you know, paleoclimatic reconstructions. It doesn't really represent well easily in this way, and sometimes a polygon, if you throw it in, it'll just take over the map, and how do we engage with that? And so now we need to figure out also how do we deal with the Y section? This is going to be a, we hope that this will be a dynamic section that kind of updates as you filter and says, here's why you got these results. And it will deeply explain why you have the related results, the contextual results, and kind of go into these sources and why, they're, uh, why the combinators match the way they did and things like that. So thank you very much. You can find us online. <laughs>